Welcome everyone to our A to J Author new user webinar. This is Jessica Frank with A to J Author. I am A to J Author's project manager. With me on the staff side um, are John Mayer, our executive director, Tobias Entrejo, our A to J backend developer, and Mike Mitchell, who is our developer from Batovi, who works on A to J Author. So we're all on the call hoping to get feedback from you guys. And so we're, we're a small group, but um, this session is being recorded and we'll be talking more about ways in which we're gonna use um, this as a spring springboard for community involvement. So the topic for this month's call is community outreach. So we want your feedback on issues that we have in our bug fix issue queue. Um, improvements you like to see in A to J author and anything else you want to talk to us about. So we're getting um, through the summer season where we did a big um, CanJS upgrade. So that's the back end of A to J author. We have new features that are going to be coming up next year um, as we work through our current grants. So this is sort of a good time to um, see where you all are at and get feedback from you on how we can improve A to J author. So we want you to give us our feedback. The point of this webinar is um, to interrupt me as much as possible, throw those comments um, or questions into the chat or the question box, raise your hand, I'll unmute you. We really wanna hear from you. Um, if you aren't as comfortable with sort of airing it publicly, um, I have a survey at the end and we're gonna be sending out a survey um, in the next couple of weeks to get sort of larger community feedback. So there's a couple of ways you can engage with us. And as always, you can email me, jessica at cali.org. For today's agenda, I'd like to first go through sort of the top 10-ish issues that I see in our issue queue as relevant um, for priorities going forward and get your feedback on how we should rank those and what, what should come first. So I know the order that I'd fix them in, but I'd really like to know what order you'd want them addressed in. Then I'm gonna open up the floor for discussion of any other current issues or future features that would make your authoring experience better. And then finally, I'd like to get some feedback on what you want discussed in our November and December and even the 2020 webinars. So generally these webinars, um, I find an A to J author topic that's come up in the last month or so that I haven't done a webinar on recently or um, a video that could be improved and we present on that and it's mainly for new authors. Sometimes we do community feedback um, webinars like this, and sometimes I have guest speakers. Um, so it's sort of, um, I could just keep going along that path, but if there's something that you would wanna learn more about, or a video that you've watched that could be improved upon, um, or a guest presenter you'd like to see, I'd love to hear that feedback as well. Also, um, as I said, feel free to stop me at any time by raising your hand, putting the question in the chat box, um, if you want to talk more in depth about the issue or if you want to um, voice an opinion on its priority or anything, just feel free to interrupt. Same goes for my co-presenters um, as well. So our current issue queue has 502 open issues as of yesterday when I looked at it. Um, some of these are outdated. Some of them are related to things that you as authors or your end users will never see, sort of the back end stuff. But many of them are bugs that you've reported or features that have been requested. Generally, um, the way we work is within a grant funded structure. So we have new features that we work on that are grant funded by TIG projects or other grants. And then I work with our team with John, Tobias and Mike, and we go through the other issues in the queue that aren't directly grant funded and sort of figure out um, how we're gonna fit those in with the development resources and the time that we have in that month or in the larger year for planning. And a lot of the time it's the squeaky wheel that's gonna get the attention. So if something is bothering you or affecting your work, please feel free to reach out to me and email me and let us know. Um, we can likely start working on that and get, um, get it resolved for you. Um, and so not just during this sort of com community feedback season, but anytime. Um, if something is a snag or is not working as you expected um, or is hindering your use of A to J author, please feel free to reach out. But I wanted to get what I wanted to do today is to give you all the opportunity to sort of weigh in on the future development of A to J author. So I'm going to go through these next couple of uh, nine slides and I'm going to talk through the top issues that I see in our queue. And then we'll, you'll have a chance to rank them by order of importance with a little survey monkey. Um, at the end of it. 
So if anytime you don't understand what I'm talking about or you want to interrupt, uh, interject, please feel free to interrupt and raise your hand. If my co-presenters can keep an eye on the questions, um, that would be helpful, please. Will do. Thank you. So the first issue up is support for IE11. Um, we currently support IE11, Edge, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, pretty much any modern browser, for the A to J viewer. The authoring side of it, we support in Chrome, Safari, and Firefox, but not Edge and IE, um, simply because they take too much extra development time, and we feel that authors can, um, we can control sort of the browsers that authors are using a little bit better than the end users. But IE11 is getting increasingly more difficult to develop in. Um, it's being uh, sort of um, deprecated across the internet, just like Flash was or is. Um, and I looked at our current traffic from IE11 specifically in the A to J6 viewer yesterday. Um, and for the last two months, only 4% of users have accessed an A to J guided interview um, in the the kind that has our analytics, the A to J6 viewer. Um, it's only 4% in the last two months. And so we're reaching out to you guys to see how much effort we should continue to put into IE11 support, or if it's something that we should think about end of lifing um, potentially for support. Now, Edge works generally the same as Chrome or Firefox, and that would continue to be supported. Um, but this is, so this is just IE11, not all Microsoft browsers. Um, I found an article the other day that was talking, and I confirmed it with Mike and Tobias um, in one of our stand-up calls about how just working with IE11 can increase development time by about um, 30 percent. So any time we do have that can be spent on new features takes 30 percent more time then to make sure that it works in IE11 and to come up with a hack. It also increases maintenance time, i.e., um, requires that JavaScript needs to be compiled to ES5 instead of ES6, so it increases the time for all the users to use A to J, um, the A to J viewer, in order to support just the 4% of, uh, of them that are using IE11. Um, it requires more maintenance time because you have to do hacks for, to, for um, IE11, and then IE11, those hacks have to then be made sure that they're cap um, compatible with future development. So this is sort of reaching out to see how you feel about IE11 support. So um, is it worth it for us to continue to spend sort of limited resources on IE11? Or should we come up with some sort of end, end of life, end of support um, plan for that? So um, with any of these slides, feel free to jump in. Feel free to raise your hand. I'll unmute you. Otherwise, you'll have an opportunity at the end um, of these to rank. So I'll pause like a few seconds at the end of each slide after the explanation in case anybody wants to jump in. Jessica, just as a side note from the developer side, uh, Microsoft has announced that they will be backporting their new version of Edge, which will be based on Chromium. Mm -hmm. uh, to operating systems that currently rely on IE11. So in addition to costing 30% to make these features work and fix these extra bugs and things, it's also possible that all of those extra fixes and features will no longer be needed when they finally do backport that browser because it will be compatible with modern standards. Thank you. Yeah, that's where we're hearing a lot of the IE11 like still needs to be in um, places where computers might be older, um, court kiosks, libraries, um, that kind of thing. So it's still only 4% of our general traffic. So um, that's sort of where we're, we're wondering. Oh, let's see, we have a hand raised. Um, I'm not seeing the hand, John. Can you unmute if you see a hand raised? Okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. So, I, I, I just to get get the the conversation going, um, uh, as, as well as um, 
I, I see Internet IE 11 as an either or. If uh, I think it's more important that we work on compatibility with the uh, mobile browsers, uh, whatever's on, whatever is the most popular on iPhones and Androids, than on. Uh, in other words, if we have limited resources and we have to like uh, pick, you know, which of our children we want to save. I'd rather save the mobile children than the IE 11 children. Maybe that's a Sophie's choice, bad Sophie's choice joke. Um, and, I, and, and just because I'm, I'm perceiving that, more and more people are leaning on mobile browser access more so than they are trying to pull along the, the, the last few uh, kiosks or uh, other you know old desktops that require you know that are on Windows XP or you know Windows 7 that that in which the only browser they're allowed to install is uh, IE 11, you know, um, and so maybe you know we we we've done enough in that sort of like you know accommodating people and now it's time to pull the last few folks onto the onto this onto the the safety boat so to speak. Thanks. All right, I'm not seeing any other um, feedback, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, so this next one is one that our team has gone back and forth on, and I wasn't 100% sure I wanted to bring it up on this call because it's a little bit deep in the weeds, um, but bear with me for a minute because it came up um, this week with an author. So currently, true-false variables have three states. They can be true, they can be false, and they can be unanswered or null. So what that means is that there, um, if you have a checkbox, like, do you agree, um, you know, we're not your lawyer, check this box to agree. If it is checked, it is true. If it is unchecked, it's unanswered. It's not automatically false because of that third state. Um, by default, it is, if a checkbox is unchecked, it is unanswered. Um, so we sort of have a split in how authors are dealing with this. Um, so we have authors who expect a true-false variable to have two options. If it's checked, it's true. If it's unchecked, it's false. So by default, all um, true-false variables are false until they are checked. And they use logic then to test for false. Um, and we also have authors who are expecting that third state of unanswered. So the end user never saw the question. They went down a path that didn't result in them even seeing the checkbox. Um, or they didn't answer it, like this example here. Um, and they are testing then for false or null um, in their logic and using that as well. So the, um, the question is, or the discussion is, how to handle true-false variables. Should we have two states or should we have three? Should we create um, another variable? So we have a three-state one currently. Should we make a strictly true-false um, variable type that people can use? Um, so it's sort of like either way, authors are going to have to change how their interviews are working currently um, to make it work within the new environment. And so we're looking for feedback from all of you on that. So again, I'll pause for a second if you feel inspired to speak. Um, it's like a church revival here. You got to st stand up if you feel um, compelled to talk about this issue. Otherwise, I will move on. Um, to another one. And again, you'll have um, time at the end to vote on this and give us feedback uh, individually. Jessica, a quick question for you. Sure. I only have the ability to chat to organizers and panelists. Oh, okay. So I don't know if I'm seeing chats from everybody else. Okay. So okay. I might not see a hand raised if somebody raises it. Just letting you know, I'm not sure if that's true for all of us. Okay, thanks. I'll keep an eye on them. I have the thing open. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, so the next one up um, is in terms of prioritization for the optimization of A to J interview, A to J author for larger interviews. So the question is, um, are you generally authoring large interviews, think 50 to 100 questions or more, or are you generally authoring small interviews, like only a dozen um, or more questions. So just in my list, the far right screenshot that's not moving, that's not a GIF, um, is just from my, my list of interviews, and I have a range from four kilobytes to 799 or 779. So we have a huge spread in terms of 
um, the size of interviews that authors are working on. And there are things we could focus on that would optimize um, A to J for large interviews, sort of making question development easier, improving the map, speeding things up. Or are there other things like this isn't that big of a deal for you because you aren't working in giant interviews and you're not really noticing um, optimization issues. And I noticed some of our attendees on the list are ones that have dealt with the huge issues. Um, so our, our audience may skew a bit, but um, we'd love to hear about uh, like what size interviews are you generally working on? If you aren't working on the big interviews in A to J author, are you making big interviews in another tool? Like, are you just making them in hot docs? Are you looking elsewhere? Why do you choose those other tools if you are using them? And then what would you need to make those inter those large interviews in A to J author? How can we um, optimize A to J to bring you over uh, sort of full time into development in A to J? So that's sort of the feedback we're looking for there. Okay. This is John. Go ahead. You know, I know we say uh, uh, A to J author doesn't require a programmer. Um, you know, uh, it's a no code. Uh, I, I guess that's a that's a becoming a popular way to describe uh, tools like this. But when you when you get up like into 50 or 100 or 200 questions. Um, it, it feels an awful lot like programming because you're dealing with such a large number of variables, branches, and things like that. And so it may not be, it's still, as you drill down or work on an individual question or group of questions, it's not programming, right? You're filling in boxes and such, you know, but, but it sure, but, but in the big picture, you know, you realize you're trying to direct people down one path or the other path. Um, and so, and the smaller, the smaller interviews are, are vital, but, but straight, relatively straightforward because of that, because of that size. And so, you know, I'm a, I, I would vote for more, um, tools that make big interviews, not, uh, more manageable, you know, and, and I, and, you know, I, I, I would do that in three places. Uh, one of, one of them is of course the mapper. I really want a good um flowchart manipulation tool you know i want lucid chart or mind meister or mind map built right into a to j author with a drill down into the into the individual questions um you know and be, be, because because i know that when i'm working on really big interviews i'm thinking in terms of like chunks of branches or pieces of branches and stuff like that um, and yeah, that question list, when the question list gets to be one or 200, it, it becomes unwieldy because I'm constantly scrolling up and down and up and down and up and down and trying to find stuff. Um, I, uh, I, I know we, we sort it by alphabet and, and that results in doing all kinds of weird naming conventions on the, on the question names, which, which then when I need to change something, I got to go back and like, you know, renumber it or something like that. So so either some kind of automated question naming or some I don't I don't even know I know I've, I've thought about this for years and I and I don't have a a great solution but but I but I got to think that if we if we put our mind to it we'd come up with um, a better a better model than we have right now. Thanks. So this this issue is about the A to J document assembly tool the A to J DAT. Um, the A to J DAT is sort of like my baby because I've been pretty involved in its development um, and its its growth, um, but it doesn't have a ton of traction or love from the legal aid and court communities. So we're seeing it used pretty regularly in law school courses that teach A to J um, because it's just simply easier to teach law students one technology tool than to have them have to get um, another backend tool like Hot Docs. Um, but we're sort of curious about its use in the legal aid and the court community. So I understand that it's it's another tool to use. It's it's newish. You may not be all that interested in learning something else. But what could we add to it that would make it more appealing to this community? Or why aren't you um, creating a ton of your guided interviews and your A to J DAT templates um, for use? So uh, one of the ideas that was floated by an author was to allow for fillable PDFs. 
So the court in his state already did the work of creating all of these fillable PDFs with the fields already there. Um, and then they wanted to automate on top of that. And so the idea was that um, it could you could just import a fillable PDF um, and repurpose all of those variable fields that already have been drawn. Um, his example he sent me is very similar to this with, you know, dozens of fields already on it, the already checkboxes are already aligned, all that stuff is already there. It would just be great to to reuse those all as, as um, blank fields in A to J. So, um, and currently right now you have to flatten the PDF before you can upload it to A to J and work on top of it. So that would be um, the current state versus where we would see it going. So any thoughts on the DAT um, or um, ways we can improve it? Would you love fillable PDFs being able to be used? Is there something else that you would like to see from the DAT? Um, and this sort of even goes into, should we continue developing out features um, in the DAT in the future, if um, you're interested in using those? The DAT is hosted on LHI. Um, and you can self-host it if you are um, uh, interested in putting it up on your own system. Tobias is here to support you with that side of it. Um, and so it's not uh, an accessibility issue anymore in terms of like there was no place to host it, no place to put it, uh, how to run it. It's available the same as um, any other guided interview. Front end, you can always add a DAT to an existing interview. Okay, Matt, I see your hand is raised. I'm going to unmute you. You are unmuted, Matt. Thanks. Hi, Jessica. Hey. Um, I'm just wondering, are there plans to have the DAT accommodate uh, multiple document assembly? Um, it does now. You can have multiple templates inside of one, um, one A to J guided interview. Um, but will it produce separate PDFs? Oh, okay. That's um, interesting. It, right now, yeah, it just produces the one singular PDF. But with that, yeah. with the ability to have each template be its own PDF, be a, sort of a selling point for you guys? Yeah, that's one reason why we can't use it, because in Illinois, the e-filing requirement, mm -hmm. they have to be uh, separate uh, documents. So, um, yeah, then we could uh, separate all the, like, instructions and things you'd file up front, things you bring to court, all that kind of stuff. That's one reason why we can't uh, can't use it oh. for the e-filable uh, forms. Okay, thank you. That sure. is excellent feedback. Okay, I'm going to re-mute you and let me know if you want me to um, unmute you again. I'm going to lower your hand. Okay. Um, so the next one down, so this one um, seems to mostly relate to a select handful of authors, but it's still sort of like community feedback on this one. Um, currently, the only place that you can work on a complete A to J guide to interview is within A to J.org. So you can download your interview file, unzip it, edit the guide.xml file um, with something like Notepad++, but then you aren't able to put it back in the file, re-zip it, and re-upload the entire thing to A to J. You get this no valid um, .a to J or .xml file was found in the zip um, if it is re-zipped locally. So we have authors that um, like to make small, some changes to the XML file or even some law students who um, sort of accidentally unzip it when they download it and then it becomes a problem of we have to, um, well, we, Mike has to re-zip it up on on our side um, to get it to upload properly to a to j.org. So um, I know this one has made our dev team a little bit nervous about allowing this process, but um, I felt the need to ask you guys, are you all interested in editing someplace other than a to jauthor.org? And if you are, what is your use case for editing um, it locally rather than just making the changes inside A to J author. What is that sticking point that you would prefer to go outside rather than just work inside A to J author? Um, and so if with any of sort of the issues that pop up or things that you would like to improve in A to J, feel free to ask for it, but it's always helpful if we have some sort of why or what are you using it or is there something we could add to A to J that would make um, you not have to do X, whatever you're doing, or, or not need that other enhancement or to go outside of it. 
um, that's all we're always sort of looking for that. Jessica, it's Mike. Hey. Uh, the last bit is actually <clears throat> what Tobias and I are most interested in. If you're editing outside of the authoring app itself, then to us that feels like a missing feature that we'd like to add so that it makes it easier on everybody to edit what you need to edit and also keep the XML and everything uh, valid so that we don't get errors like this. Thanks. So this next one is about error messages um, in general inside of A to J Author. So we have some basic error messaging that you'll see in the logic section um, if you've done something wrong and we have like undefined variable or it'll tell you if you have if you're missing a bracket or a, co a colon or um, a parenthesis something like that it gives you basic feedback about what's wrong with it but it could be better and there are also places um, outside of logic in the interview where you make mistakes and they're not flagged as errors until you try to run the interview and you get a page isn't connected or you've done a repeat loop wrong, or you have a field without a variable in it and you don't realize it until your document's not assembling on LHI and you're just getting you know, document uh, ge not generated errors. All of these things are ways in which we can make it easier for authors um, to validate that they have done authoring correctly. Um, so would you want more feedback from the system when you make a mistake? Or would that just get in your way? So would you wanna be able to turn on and off the warnings? Um, sometimes when I'm authoring, I like to make all my questions and then I go back and I connect them one at a time at the very end after everything else has been put in the interview. But some of the warnings we talked about would throw up um, an error every time I opened a page or tried to close it that said, hey, you forgot to connect this question to another question. Um, or if I put in placeholders in logic, like if, um, you know, income is too high, go to, and I just put quote space quote, because I'm gonna come back and put the name of the question once I make that question, um, I'd get a warning that said, you know, this isn't a valid page name. Um, so that might be somewhat annoying to see errors all the time, or it's too many errors and you, st you start ignoring them. Um, would you want additional features like error messaging in more places or warning symbols like this or something where it's you know the warning and then it tells you how many errors are in it. Another um, thing we brought up is potentially adding a new tab that would be called like all errors or, um, or QA, something like that. So a small warning will be thrown up in place um, when you're authoring, you can ignore it. And then when you wanna go back and do QA and fix everything, you could go to the all errors tab and sort of delve in and fix you know, I didn't connect this, I didn't um, put a bracket here, I spelled the variable name wrong, I did the wrong page in, um, in the go-to, I don't have a variable in this field, fix all those things in one place. So better error messaging inside of the interview and potentially a place where all of that error messaging is in one place um, that you could work through. Sort of any improvements for the QA process is what, what we're looking for too. Okay, so this slide is a catch-all for a couple of different issues in our queue, but they are all related to special or non-English characters inside of A to J Author. So the first one, we've seen um, variables in interviews, like in Spanish, if the interview's in Spanish, the author created, translated the variables also, um, and the variable names had tildes or accents um, in it, and we just had a bug fix this summer for that. Now they're escaped so that they aren't going to be corrupting the XML, but should we actually allow them in the variable names if possible? Um, the other one is ampersands. This was a big issue when we started using A to J Author 6 heavily in law schools about um, four, year, four or five years ago. And all law students love to use the ampersand instead of typing out the word and. Um, I get it, I'm that millennial age, and I even used it in the title of this slide, which I did unconsciously at first, and then when I typed it in and realized what I was doing, I kept it in as uh, using it ironically um, in there. So ampersands in the name of step signs um, 
are allowed. We've we've fixed that, but should we allow sort of these special characters, um, foreign language uh, characters for foreign languages, that kind of stuff in A to J? Um, it also includes in um, variables spaces underscores uh, spaces and underscores are treated sort of the same way. Is there a need to have those treated separately? Um, also included in this is additional languages. So we support 16 languages right now, but should we be adding more languages? Are there languages that you would want but don't have? Um, is there a desire to author more in foreign languages, languages besides English, but something is holding you up? If you aren't developing in foreign languages and you want to be developing in foreign languages, what is the sticking point to why you're not creating tons of interviews? Um, we have a decent number of interviews in Spanish. There's a couple in French and there's a couple outliers in the other additional languages, but there's really not heavy development um, in those uh, foreign languages, which um, it could be made easier um, with some translation support, um, but we want to know what that is. So that is what this ticket is about or this um, slide is about. Again, feel free to interrupt if you want. Not seeing anything in the questions. To be clear, a lot of the special character stuff is in things like variables and author only side of things. You obviously can still, the question text can be translated to Spanish or whatever and, and not be affected. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, so this is another one that has given us um, plenty of headaches on the dev side in the past. Um, and it's headaches on the authoring side, too. So the authoring side, um, it's a headache for authors because it should just be easy to copy and paste from anywhere into A to J. You know, you get your Word document or your Google Doc or your whatever from your subject matter expert. It should be easy to just copy and paste, slap those questions into A to J and move on to the meat of the, the development that um, you as a developer have to do rather than the subject matter expert in drafting the questions. It's a headache on the dev side because we're dealing with an infinite number of places that people could be copying from and pasting from, um, and that does weird things. And we're looking at UWord and your weird secret formatting that you sneak in. Um, that's particularly painful. Um, at least it feels painful for me. Um, so should we devote more dev time to making copy and paste as smooth as possible? Um, what about if you had to copy from one place first and then put it into the question text? Um, like if there was a spot in A to J you had to copy into first and then take that and copy it into the question text, is that worth it? Sort of how do you feel about copy and paste and how it's currently working? This is John. I'll speak for everybody. Yes, 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 yes. Please, please make copy and paste, you know, um, seamless. Um, um, I, I know it, I, I mean, I don't know how many times I've copied into Notepad and then paste and then cut and paste out of Notepad um, in, in not just an AJ author and so many other tools where I think the, the paste from Word thing is broken or not working. Um, but, but if you could make me stop having to think about it, that would be just like so completely awesome. Um, uh, the problem, of course, is that, you know, you, you're always afraid of, like, you lose links or you lose um, uh, bolding and italics and stuff like that. But even, you know, even just a clean paste, you know, a text-only paste, you know, would be so much better. I, I, might, I prefer a smart paste, but, but, but in, so many, in so many other tools um, or, or, or software, uh, I often find that the smart paste is, is just a little smart. It's not smart enough. You know, and I end up uh, dropping back to, you know, just paste of text and uh, sort of a thing. Um, but, you know, and I, want, and I wanted to use this as an example. Um, I mean, we, 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 we know what, what hurts or what, what, what problems authors have because we do a lot of authoring ourselves. But we don't want to make, you know, we live in our own bubble as the development team. And so, so that's why we're having this meeting is to, you know, to make sure that, our, that what we think is obvious or necessary you know, actually is rather than just assuming that we know everything about what you guys are doing out there. So, you know, I, I didn't want to let you think that um, we, we weren't aware of those things. 
Thanks, John. Matt, I see you, and I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, Matt. You're unmuted. Uh, thanks. I'll second what John said. Um, it would be great if there was just an option to either paste or uh, paste as plain text, either through a right-click context-sensitive menu or a Control-Shift-V. Um, that alone would save a ton of time and would be wonderful. Cool. Thank you. That's good feedback. Um, let me see if there's anyone else. Let me remute you. Okay. Um, so the final one on the sort of top 10 list that I thought about um, was the sharing of guided interviews and components. So you all do a lot of work building your guided interviews. And a lot of the time, there are things that are similar or um, even exactly the same from one interview to the next, like your um, introduction, your description of the interview or the process of how it goes through, how um, this isn't legal advice, how they have to agree to it or not, um, sort of stuff at the end about how what happens next in the sort of the flow of um, the document assembly project. And so that is something that could be shared from interview to interview. Um, and also the process of sharing guided interviews um, amongst your team. So right now you either have to share an account and make sure that people aren't in at the same time making different changes to um, a single interview file. You ha or you have to download, email, or share, re-upload, work on it in your account, re-download it, send it on. It's just a little bit clunky. Um, and we've talked a lot about um, creating sort of a Google Docs-esque feel where you could share um, the ability to edit an interview, um, even the ability to sort of create, uh, to send the file on to another user, and then yours would be locked in a read-only um, sort of position until they released it or, or they worked on it. Um, just how much effort do we put into um, figuring out how to, how to optimize A to J for sharing guided interviews or sharing parts of interviews, like chunks of questions, share a step, share an individual question. Um, if someone's done a repeat loop in a really great way, wouldn't it be great to just, you know, take that uh, collecting of children's information for a divorce um, into your interview and make the small changes that you need to um, if they have all the logic and sort of questions scripted out the way you like it? How much effort should go into uh, that side of it? That's what this question's about. Oh. Matt, you're unmuted again. Uh, thanks. Um, I just want to say the ability to reuse components, uh, whether it be copying a full page and then bringing over all the variables or uh, even a full step with, with everything, um, that would be such an aid to development. It would save uh, a lot of time, especially when there are forms that we have, like in Illinois, that have a similar block um, and we have to just manually recreate all the questions and all the variables and all the logic. And that would be so wonderful if we could just uh, move it from one interview to the other. I know it's very complex, but uh, I just want to say that that's probably our number one uh, request of all the things that we'd love to see in A to J author. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other um, hands or feedback. So here is the point at which you can vote. Um, I'm going to put into the chat this link um, to the Survey Monkey. And so what this is, um, and I'll, it's going to be shared here. You can vote right now. You can vote later. You can share it with your colleagues in case there are other people who um, use A to J and just aren't on the webinar today. Um, and a version of this is going to go out to the larger community. Um, in the next week or so um, with an explanation sort of like I gave today of what the issues are and, and ranking sort of um, the bugs and prioritization. But please feel free to go to the Survey Monkey to rank the ones we've talked about today um, to tell us about any other bugs that are really sticking points. Um, not promising we can do it, but at least if we know about it, um, we can start putting it into the development timeline. Um, there's also a field for any features. So is there something that you would just love to see in A to J? Um, you really want to be able to do X. It doesn't do it now. Um, and you really just want it. Tell us what it is and just give us like a sentence or two about why to do it. Um, like Mike said, that 
it really helps um, convince the devs that it's something that is worthwhile and it um, helps our team prioritize if we can explain why um, that, that issue or that thing needs to be added. And then finally, at the end of the survey is just a general comments section um, to let us know anything else you want. Um, we're just going to use these internally with our team in terms of your direct responses may do some sort of like, you know, 50% of the community wants us to do X kind of thing. But um, you can also feel free to um, always just email me, jessica at cali.org, to let us know about um, any issues that you're having with A to J or any features you'd like to see. There is a contact us web form for both technical problems and bug or and feature requests on the website under the about section. You can do that anonymously as well if you want. So thank you um, for everyone for attending and for participating. And we'd love to hear from you in the future. Uh, one of the things that um, was an idea that Mike brought was that we should do sort of quarterly um, this sort of feedback quarterly. So I'm um, just going to do probably simple email that has a survey in it saying like, hey, um, these are the top five or 10 things that we see for the next couple months. How should we address them? What order should we work on them? Let the community vote. Um, and then that can help us get other um, people into the prioritization um, bubble instead of just our dev team. So we're going to start doing that on a regular basis. Um, probably starting in 2020. So thank you all for attending. Um, other panelists, do you all have anything to add? There's no other feedback. Hi, this is John. Yeah, this won't, obviously this isn't the only opportunity. Um, we're we're going to reach out and uh, sometimes it's hard to uh, gather your thoughts in, in in a sentence or two on a, on a, on a webinar like this. So we're going to reach out to some of the, some of the folks that we know um, to have longer conversations, um, you know, more free form about uh, the present and future of A to J author. Um, and if there's any of you that want to want to be talked to, that want to have a have an audience with us um, or or have a conversation with us, uh, please reach out to Jessica and we'll we'll schedule something. All right. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you all for attending and for filling out the survey and sharing it as much as possible. And I will see you all in November for the monthly call, first Thursday of November. Thank you.